unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Psalm 34, verses 8. If you're there, you say, Amen. Give me the amplified version. The Bible says, Oh, test and see that the Lord our God is good. Tell your neighbor, the Lord our God is good. Turn to the neighbor on the other side and tell them, the Lord our God is good. Hallelujah. Test and see that the Lord our God is good. I mean, certain people, if, if you don't know the goodness of God, you have not yet tested. The problem is not that God is not good. Uh-uh. The problem is that you have not what? Tested. But the Bible says, test and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Any man who has tested him will tell you that the Lord is what? He's good. He's good. He is so good. He is so good. But you know, man of God, you're speaking, but you don't know what I'm going through. That doesn't change what God is. God is so good. Tell your neighbor, he is so Yes. He says, oh, test and see that the Lord our God is what? Is good. Now he says, blessed, or that is happy, fortunate, to be envied is the man who trusts and takes refuge in him. I mean, any man who trusts and takes refuge in God. The Bible says that man is a happy man. Hallelujah. The Bible says that that man is a fortunate man. The Bible says that that man is is to be envied. That means when you trust God a certain way and regard him to be your refuge, you will not miss out on people envying you. Hallelujah. You'll attract the spirit of envy. You'll think it's rejection. It's not rejection. Uh -uh. There's something upon you that brought you to the notice of others. Somebody shout hallelujah. God is good. Tell your neighbor God is good. And I'm a man who trusts in God. Yes. And because of that, you say, I am happy. I am fortunate. And I am to be envied. People envy me. You say it. People envy me. People look at me I want, and want to be me. You say it. People look at me and want to be like me. They want to talk and walk like me. They want to sleep and live like me. Come on, say it. Confess it. The communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. If you're a believer of God, they envy you. You know, there was days, many days when the church was a little more ignorant than it is now. Where to be born again, people looked at you with pity. They said, Bambi, dear girl. And she received Jesus. You know? But now they envy you. Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Then he says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Revere and worship him. He says, For there is no want to those who truly, 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 underline the word truly. He says, There is no want to those who truly revere and worship him with godly fear. They Truly, those who truly revere God, those who truly revere God, he says there is no want, no man who truly fears God, no man who truly honors God, no man who truly worships God wants anything. You know, we used to live in a time, and I remember back in the day when people used to teach and say, you know, for me, I can... It's, it's okay to have Jesus eh? and have nothing. That is understandable, but it is impossible. To have Jesus 
and have nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is okay. The statement is okay. The statement is right, but it cannot be true. You can't truly be a believer in Jesus Christ. He says, and be a reviler of this God to be somebody who truly fears him and you want. He says, the Lord is my what? My shepherd. He says, you shall not what? Want. I shall not want. It is the reason why you will not want. Because Jesus is with you. The Bible says, all things are yours. And you're Christ. The Bible says he has given us all things freely to enjoy. Freely to enjoy. So, much as it, it might pass for a godly party to say, you know, for me, I can have Jesus and have nothing. You cannot have him and have nothing. Just say, you would rather have Jesus than anything else. Okay, that one is true. You'd rather have Jesus than what? Anything else. But you can't say that me, I'd rather have Jesus and have nothing. It's not possible. It's not possible. Tell your neighbor it's not possible. Now, th this guy goes down to, to, to continue in verse 10 and says, The young lions lack food and what? And suffer hunger. But they who seek and inquire of and require the Lord, he says, by right of their what? Their need on the authority of his word. He says, none of them shall lack any beneficial thing. Slap somebody and tell them, luck is not my story. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has said, the young lions lack food and they hunger. But those who seek and inquire and require the Lord, by right of their need, by right of their need it means because they need on the authority of his word. Because they place their need on the authority of his word. That's what he's saying. Because every time they, they look at their need, they look for his word. They place a demand on his word. Oh! Somebody shout hallelujah. Yes. He says because of the right of their need on the authority of the, of the word. In other words, one, they know that it is their right not to lack. It's not something they plead over with God. You know, God, why don't you come out from up there, heaven, and help me? You know, <laughs> it is your right. Tell your neighbor, it is your right not to lack anything beneficial. It's your right. And so, they place their right on their need, on the authority of God's word. To say, you know what, God? You said you shall supply all my needs. You said on the authority of your word. So, uh, it's my right. It's my right. Tonight, I want to kick luck out of you and your house. Tonight. That's, that's what I'm going to labor to do. That's what I'm going to labor to do. I'm going to kick the mentality of luck out of your life forever. Forever. That if you lack anything one day and you wake up to this sermon, it will put you back on your path when you feel like you're becoming a bit more funny. Do you understand what I'm saying? Tonight we want to deal with the issue of luck. You know, Africa is a poor continent. Right? They say more than 400 million people on the face of Africa live below a dollar a day. More than 400 million people on the face of Africa, live below a dollar a day. More than 400 million people in Africa. Poverty is a spirit. Poverty is a spirit. And it can only live when we teach the right way. It can't live by manipulating people and deceiving guys and promising people things that are not scriptural. Men of God. God has told me that 200 people here, each one of you bringing 2 million. <laughs> okay. Now, let me explain this. And I want you to tell your neighbor this statement because it will sink that way. Tell your neighbor, luck is a consciousness. Turn to the other neighbor too and tell them, luck is a consciousness. That defines your thought line and manifests its effects. 
on your life. That is what it is. Lack is a mentality. It's a consciousness. It defines the thought line of many people. And then they start to think with the mentality of luck. And when they think with the mentality of luck, they start having the manifestations of luck. Are you following what I'm saying? They start having the manifestations of luck. And some really don't necessarily lack, but they've not lived to the fullness of what God has placed in their lives. And here, I could even go beyond money. Lack anything beneficial. Anything beneficial. Family. Lack anything beneficial. Career. Lack anything beneficial. Even things money cannot buy. If they are beneficial, the Bible says God has said none of them shall lack anything beneficial. So it can go to that far. Now, why do I say that this is a consciousness? Because many people think that lack is a state. Let me tell you something. Lack has never been a human state since the inception of the idea of divine creation. Most so when he said, let us now create man in our own image and likeness. God has never had a mentality to create man with luck. Even in man's fallen nature, God did not create a consciousness for man to luck. But man in his foreign nature grew the consciousness to luck. Are you following what I'm saying? So it's a fallen nature thought line. It's a fallen nature consciousness for a man to lack. And I'll explain that. I'll explain that. Remember when he created Adam and Eve in the garden? Were they a new creation? Hey, was Adam and Eve a new creation? No. Adam and Eve were not a new creation. They were pneumaticos, but they were not numa. They had tenets of the spiritual, but they were not spirit. They were a living soul. The Bible says he breathed into them and then man became a living soul. They were a living soul. The virtue of what defined the spiritual part of them was that the soul had received the breath of life. That is why later he says in Corinthians, how be that the first was natural and the second was spiritual. The first Adam was a natural man. He says the first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from above. So the first dynamic nature, or anybody here who is listening to me, if you're not born again, you're just a natural man. Hallelujah. And if there's anything spiritual, whatever spiritual is, is only because the divine intercepts with your soul. That's the only reason. So there are parts of the natural man that are spiritual. But that doesn't make the natural man spirit. Oh, but then you say, but you see in the Old Testament, they used to say the spirit of a man. Yes, if you go literally and read from the Hebrew, you realize many of the time they are referring to the thoughts or the heart of a man. But the center there, they are defining much of the soul than it is for the spirit. Because the first man was natural. The second was spiritual. Praise God. He says, how be that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, which is spiritual. Are you following what I'm saying? But even the natural man in his state, the Bible says he created the garden before the man entered. Isn't it? And he told him you shall eat. That means there was no scarcity of food. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? There was no lack. He told him you shall eat of every tree in the garden. Except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But he says but you shall eat of everything. That means he had abundance to eat. And one thing people don't understand. That Eden did not have seasons. Otherwise he would have said you shall eat of everything 
that is in the garden according to its given season. No, Eden did not have season. Eden was subject to respond to the man's need. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is why when you grow up in God and the consciousness of lack leaves you, you realize that you define your season. You don't live according to the season of the world. Uh -uh. You define your season. Tell your neighbor, I define my season. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says he shall produce fruit in his season. He shall produce fruit in his season. He shall bear fruit in his season. Praise the Lord. The message shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth what? His fruit in his, 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 his season. And he says, and his leave also shall not wither. With soever you shall do, or he does, the Bible says, it shall what? Prosper. Everything shall prosper. Why? Because it's not based on the season of the world. It's based on your season with God. And our season is defined by faith. Oh, Rakata. He says, when men say there's a casting down, you shall say that there's a what? There's a lifting up. And a man changes a season immediately. People are weeping and crying, but for you there's bounty in your bonds. Hallelujah. People are struggling and striving with the world, but for you, you have more than enough than you need. Oh, don't you care? Of course I care. That's why God gave me too much to give to the poor. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. But you see, Many people have not understood that before Adam fell with Eve, they were never conscious of luck. You could talk of anything, but not luck. They never used to sleep with the attitude and consciousness of luck. They never used to wake up with the attitude and consciousness of, the luck, of luck. In fact, the Bible says water used to come from the ground and it used to what? To water the what? the garden. So the garden was green 24-7. But there was something supernatural about them. That for them anything that they would turn to it had to feed them. He said you shall eat of everything. That means you're not limited to each season or when it's available to sell, you know. He didn't say oh in the time when each season is there. No. He said of anything. That means everything was available for man. And there was no need to waste either. Because it was preserved for man. It stayed ready for man. Do you understand? The co it was stayed ready for man. So there was no corruption. There was no corruption. You know, some people don't understand that when corruption entered in this world, it's the very thing that enters as a, a fruit. And that fruit starts to ripen and then rot. Before corruption came in the world, fruits never used to rot. Because that's corruption therein. There was no definition of death. There was only the existence of life. So imagine an apple tree with red apples and they are constantly there. Hey, good. Heaven will be fun. Praise God. I'm starting to think when you meditate pork in heaven, it just arrives. They don't cut the pig. <laughs> Praise God. Because I, I, listen, I have thought about it many times. I can't imagine that heaven won't have pork. I'm trying. But I failed to get the imagination. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, I was just... I'm playing. Praise God. Now it says, So Adam fell. And part of the cast from the ground was that he was to eat bread from the what? From the ground. From the, by the sweat of his brow, he says. He said that by the sweat... Of your face. The Bible says you shall till the ground to eat bread. But you see. Listen to this. He says in the sweat of your face. Shall you eat bread. Till you return unto the ground. For out of it was you taken. And dust thou art. And to dust thou shall return. He says you will eat bread until you die. That means it's almost as though. Bread of the fallen man is unto death. It, it is there to sustain man until he dies. That is why when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, of life, of life, he, he means I'm not the bread that leads to death. 
He says, I'm the bread of life. I am the bread. I am the bread. I am the bread of life. I am the bread. He says, when he says, I am the bread of life, it means that the bread that you eat in Christ does not tend to life, to death, sorry. It tends to life. But the bread eaten by the fallen man, the Bible says, after the sweat, of his, uh, the sweat on his face, he was to till the ground. And then after tilling the ground, uh, the Bible says, he shall eat of the bread until he returns to the ground. Till he returns to the ground. That bread does not give life. So the tilling of the ground again defines the season. This is the season of planting. This is the season of the harvest. This is the season of that. This is the season of this. Praise God. So it's rightful to say for as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest. That earth was defined that way. Because of a fallen nature. Before the fallen nature, it wasn't seed and harvest. It was harvest. Because seed had been done in the creation story. He created everything, praise God, with its seed therein. That means, for, in the mind of God, right? Seed was never an issue because every, every herb has its own seed within. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every herb has its own seed within. Do you understand what I'm saying? That means in the creation story, once you eat the fruit, the seed in there stirs it to produce another one. It didn't need a season. It was divine. You didn't need to till the ground to water it and make sure you prune and then you, then, then you whatever the soil and then you do this. No, 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 no. It, it, it. Us did not carry a lack consciousness toward man. And neither did man carry a lack consciousness toward the earth. When you carry a consciousness of lack, you have the fallen nature. Uh, in Matthew, you, I, let me remind you something. In Matthew, chapter 21, verses 18, you remember the story of how God, Jesus, walks to the fig tree. Now, I want to show you the nature. Jesus has a certain nature. The Bible says in the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. And then when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to eat and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said, let no fruit grow in thee henceforth forever, and presently the fig tree withered. Why did it wither? Because he didn't find fruit. But why didn't he find fruit? Because it was not the season for it to bear fruit. But you see, it's not in the consciousness of the Son of God. Who is understand what I'm saying? It's not in the consciousness of the Son of God to walk to a fig tree and it does not have a, a fruit in the name of that it's not its season. It's not there. I think he also has a similar account of in Mark or something. Why? He says, you see, he comes, you know, of course you say it's not fair, it's not the season, it's not the season for the tree to, but you see, this is a consciousness issue. Jesus would not walk to a tree, a fig tree. Uh -huh. He says, having leaves, he came to eat happily, he might find anything to eat. And when he came to eat, he found nothing but the leaves. For the time of the figs was not yet. Thank you. I would rather prefer that, the narrative of Mark 11. Right? And the Bible says, and seeing that, he cursed it. Why did he curse it? Was it fair to curse a tree? Which beyond its nature and ability did not have figs because it was not time for the figs. Listen, this was a consciousness issue. It had nothing to do with the tree. The tree maybe, maybe thought that it would relate with Jesus Christ as a son of man. But this was the son of God. That's why the Bible says he answered it. He answered it. That means spiritually that tree refused to respond to a regenerated man. It, it refused to, to respond to a divine order. It refused to respond to the life of God which was in the son of God. That's what the Bible says. And he answered it. He answered it. That means when he walked there, the tree said, no. I will not give you fig. Then he says there was a spirit of rebellion in it. He saw the devil in it. And told it, no man will eat there of you. The next day it withered. Some say, but is that fair? Yes. Where does it have the authority to talk back? When the son of God is hungry. Am I preaching to somebody? But you see, because the Son of God is 
conscious of no lack. He knows when he walks there, anything that understands that he created it. This was clear, reve- re- behaving itself unseemly to its potter. He is the creator of this thing. He knows that when he walks to it somehow, it's supposed to carry a consciousness. The son of God is hungry. Man, when you get this thing, you know I'm saying it, but many of you are understanding it here. When this thing enters your spirit, you will never give an excuse that I would have built my house. But you know in that season, you know, housing materials became so expensive. I would have done this. But you know during that time, they, they cut off my salary. And then somebody, Simaya gave me this. And then somehow my finances were wiped a bit. So I had to wait a bit to make enough. <laughs> Cautiousness. You know, some things, that's why the Bible says seller. They write things in the Bible and they say seller. You know, don't just let it pass as an understanding. Come on. He says, go inside and ponder it. Ponder on it. Think on it. Meditate on it very keenly. Create the picture of the reality of the consciousness the divine order requires for you. This is Jesus walking to a tree. Praise God. And then he finds that there are no figs. Because the time of the figs was not come. Now, that is exactly what the true was telling Jesus. It was telling him, I have refused to give you fruit because it is not time for you to have fruit. Wait. Wait for the season. Are you hearing me? That means, you know, I'm going to say this. You don't need to understand me, but you'll understand me when we get to heaven. Some of you. But some of you will understand me now. Even in the fallen world, these living things, these trees, are still conscious of the sons of God. Because that was a tree in a fallen world. But it knew with this one, I'm just going to answer no and tell him, you know, this is not the season. It knew who it was talking to. It only wanted to submit the son of God to the patterns of men of flesh. It it thought that it would put Jesus under the test of continue to be hungry. Because you see, in this nature, I have to give according to the season. He cast it. Why did it wither? Why do you think it withered? It knew that it had set itself against the gospel. He says... You shall preach this gospel to every creature. He didn't say to only an individual. He said to every creature. Every creature. Every creature. Every creature. He says every creature must be tamed. The word there for preaching means tamed. In other words, you'll put to order every creature. You'll tame every creature. Anything that was created by God is in submission to the sons and daughters of God. Everything that was created either by law or order or by man or by God, if anything is a creature, anything created, even that chair, it has an awakening to understand the child of God a certain way. Praise God somebody. And you see, When you develop that consciousness, you'll start looking mad. But over time, you'll start having results in your madness. Years ago, I gave a story. Many years ago, I had a very nice car. And I used to put CDs there to play. And then I, one time I woke up and my CDs were not working. You know, putting a CD in a car, then a CD works. The problem was not the CD player, but certain CDs had grown old to what? To work. And then I put it in, removed, put others, all four of them were not working. So there was a favorite. One morning I woke up and sort of remember this thing sometimes, I put it in and then I played. And And I said, I removed it. I said, if you do that again, 
I will break you. Then I got all these four, the rest of which are not working. I also put them there. I said, I want you to be a witness to what I'm going to do to your friends. Consciousness, hallelujah. I put the thing back in. I got it out. Eh? I said, watch. I crushed it with my hands. Two pieces. And I said, let me see whoever I put in the next. It worked. <laughs> because... other one said, now even me, they break me. You see, when you start developing a certain consciousness, you become faithful to the little. Mine was on a CD. Praise God. You get a boldness and enter that building, Musumba, and say, you church, if you don't feel, I'll curse you. Call people. Let people pass and see you and feel like they want to enter. <laughs> on your business, you tell it. If you don't psych up, I'll shut you down. And that will be an example for the rest of them. I'll start next time. That if you play with me, I shut you down. I'm your life. I'm your blood. You're my vision. I wish I have somebody with faith. Somebody say no consciousness to luck. So that, way, that is what he did to Jesus. This tree answered, spoke back to him and told him, no, I refuse. Subject yourself to time. He cast it. If it was unfair, divinely, then that tree would not have withered. But it did wither. Meaning that the son of God knew exactly what he was doing. And the tree also knew exactly what it was doing. The only people who don't understand what exactly was happening are some people who read the scripture. But Jesus and the tree and Apostle Grace, we knew exactly what was happening. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. But you see, one time I, I was dealing with people and I said to hear people mention statements like, you know, uh, those guys are prosperity preachers. Some people think that it is wrong to be prosperous. It's not wrong to be prosperous. In fact, the Bible says, <laughs> the Lord blesses you to humble you. It's part of God's... Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 16. The Bible says, he fed you with what? In the wilderness with manna, that your fathers knew not, that he might humble you. Provision is to humble. God provides for you such that he can humble you. That means prosperous men are humble. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, prosperous people are humble. May God provide for you until you humble. Until you bypass people and they say, but that woman is too humble. And then they ask you, but why are you too humble? You tell them, I'm too blessed. I'm too, too blessed. So, so blessed. I have no reason. Not. God has overfed me. I'm full of God's goodness. That's why I'm humble. The Bible says he does that, that we might humble. And that he might prove us. Do you hear that too? Don't only forget the humility. The blessing of God is to prove you. To weigh and test your heart. Against divine instruction. That is why I tell people. We are rich. You are rich. Because you understand the responsibility. Of that blessing. Are you following? Paul did not tell Timothy, charge those which are rich in this world to become a bit poorer. No. He told them, charge those that are rich in this world to be rich in what? In good works. That means he knew there are people like me and who are going to be rich anyway. But he did not tell us be poorer. No. He says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, not trusting and answering. But in the living God who has given us richly all things to enjoy. Somebody shout Hallelujah. Next verse. Next verse. That they what? That they do what? Good. That they be rich in what? Good works. Ready to what? 
to distribute, willing to what? To communicate. That is what he told us. That is what he told us. That's what he told us. That's, that's the charge on rich people. Don't be high-minded. Praise God. Do not trust in uncertain riches. They mean they won't come. It only means even if they're there, God is still your trust and your sovereign what? Life. Somebody shout hallelujah. But, and beautifully he says, who has given us all things richly? Richly. G give me the Amplified of that. The, I want to read from the Amplified. The Amplified says, as for the rich in this world, charge them not to be proud and arrogant and contemptuous of others, not to set their hopes on answered riches, but on God. Listen, who richly? Read the next word. And what? And what? No, but maybe this is a bad season. You, your, your finances will reduce a bit. Hey, help me here. What does he say? He richly and what? Ceaselessly provides us with everything for our what? That means... <laughs> Woo! That means God is going to provide for you until you die. You know, there are people who like warning. You know, handle money well because one day it will not be there. Oh, I tell you, you're not talking to me. Hallelujah. Talk to those ones who don't know who God is and what he has done for man. He said he richly gives you all things and ceaselessly provides for us everything for our enjoyment. That means provision will never cease. Every moment you wake up, you wake up to provision. Yes. God did not say there's a problem with being rich. He only said don't be arrogant. You know we have people who are rich even the way they walk. Eh? They walk looking at people like that. You greet them they be like hello. And some are contemptuous, contemptuous to others. They do things that prove that they are doing it simply because they are rich and you're poorer. Apostle Emma knows some people back where I came from in Kawempe. There was a pastor's meeting there. And these guys were arguing about a certain idea. And then one pastor stood up and asked his friend, do you have money? Uh-uh. Do you have money? Answer me. Do you have money? You don't? He said, then keep quiet. <laughs> Can you believe that? So a poor man can't speak. Of course, the Bible says the poor man's wisdom is despised. But don't impose it. Keep it in your heart. Keep it in your heart. Yeah. There's a beauty in being rich and humble. There's a beauty in being rich and humble. That's a man who knows the responsibility of prosperity. That's why I tell people, prosperity is not the church's problem. In fact, God wants you rich. More and more rich. Who will feed the orphans? Who will feed the widows? Recently, we in Rosita, we fed prisoners. And we ask them to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And after eating a morsel of meat, they received Christ. Come on, somebody. Hey! The only problem with some of us who speak of this prosperity, many of us speak of it without accountability, without responsibility, and without the maturity thereof. But that doesn't mean that it is wrong to be blessed by God. Please understand this. You can't run away from a God who intends to ceaselessly provide for you. But then me, apostle, you're telling me I don't have rent, I don't have food, I don't have anywhere to live. How do I connect to that? You cannot connect to that ceaseless flow of the provision of God when you still have the consciousness of lack. Again, how do I know you have the consciousness of lack? You asked me that question. How come you're saying that and me, I lack? You, 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 you're conscious. 
A man is not conscious of lack because he has money. Sorry, because he lacks money. There are many people who are very rich, but they are still conscious of lack. You can tell by how they give. If you're here, yeah, I don't care how rich you are. If you cannot get God's tithe or fast fruit and give it, you're, you're poor. I don't care how many millions of dollars you have on the account. If you cannot give according to the teaching of scripture, you're a poor man. How do I know? Because you're conscious of lacking and so you think that everything you keep, right, is an affirmation of your wealth. It's an assurance that you have. That's why the Bible says that the saying may come to pass. I think it's somewhere in Corinth or somewhere where he says that some have gathered much and lost it all. And then he says, and some have kept little and had much. God added unto them. Why? Because to show that you're a poor man, you, I, you need to, to look at how much you give versus how much you keep. That's how you know. One time I told somebody here on this ground, I told him, I don't know, for me, every year, I, I love to count what I give, not what I keep, because I know where the blessing is. He said, it's more blessed to give than to what? Than to receive. So if it's more blessed to give than to receive, I would rather put my mind where it's more blessed. So for me, I'm cautious of how much I give. Because I want to push myself to the giving more than how much I keep. And guess what? When that consciousness is here, you'll never outgive God. Why? Because you're blessed. And it's going to ceaselessly continue flowing. But you get here, where for you, you. And there are people like that. Eh? Got everything for them there. My. My. Some of you, you are even advised. There are people who even can advise you. You're overgiving. Even. There are people who even give and say, no, 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 you're overgiving. Reduce. Consciousness. Why? Because there are people who think that when you give out, you will lack. When you give out, they think you have reduced. No. <laughs> no. You're as bountiful as your liberal. Tell your neighbor you're as bountiful as your liberal. Yes. He says there's that which holdeth back. More than what? More than his meat. And it tendeth to what? To poverty. And there's that which scattereth. And yet what? Increases. There's that which scattereth and increases. There's a man giving and he continues to increase. And then there's a man who is saving, budgeting. You know that, by the way, I'm sorry. If you're an economist, you know, people teach people that you must learn to budget your finances. Budget on the giving side. If you're budgeting to save, right? Budget to save for two things. To give and to create wealth. Nothing in the middle. Not just to keep and then be a poor person and then you die rich. You know that people are like that, eh? They live very poor and then when they die, they say, hey, no, he left millions. They say, what? That guy? Are you sure? Yeah. Did you understand what I'm saying? If we are saving, for me, even my wife knows it, we save to create wealth, but to give. That's, that's the mentality. That's the mentality. Why? Because it's ceaseless. What do you do when things are over what? How come you even threw out old shoes in your house? Because you kept buying more. Are you hearing me? Yet we don't throw change to God. You know some of you in your giving, you throw change. You throw balance. <laughs> you check the 50, the 500, which Kofi cut off the. <laughs> oh, no, no. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's a consciousness. That's a consciousness. That's a consciousness. You know why? Because that's how the world is. The world has a lack mentality. The fallen nature has a lack mentality. A baby is born with a lack consciousness. They grow up with a lack consciousness. That's why they're selfish. Selfishness is the result of a man with a lack consciousness. 
If I give away this, I won't have that. If I give this, I won't keep that. If I give this much, I won't keep this. If I do this, I won't keep that. That's a consciousness. That's a consciousness. That's a consciousness. I told people when I was working in the bank, there was a Muslim family I knew. For them, their work was building mosques in Uganda. And every year, they used to pride in how many mosques they've built. They were Muslim. And the man died and left a will and told his son to continue doing the same. He said, every year you must give $300,000 to the building of mosques in Uganda. Every year they do it. Yet they are facing a black box, Bismillah, hero. <laughs> and then you have a Christian who does like this. You even can tell currencies by putting. To show how much conscious you are. <laughs> you no longer need to look at the money. You can do this. I know this is a 50 k this is a 20. This is a 10. This is a 5. Gwenyina ye yesu amala. Gwenyina ye yesu amala. Yeah, really? <laughs> Consciousness. Praise God. Do you know why I, I don't take time to tell? You know, people, you have to give. Who? We spend a lot of money running these meetings. You see, there's a consciousness I can't put in your heads. If I get 100 people, each giving me this much, we shall do this. I don't listen. <laughs> Men of God, we have to stop that stuff. You don't need 100 people each giving a million shillings or 200 million shillings for Sumaya to have two million and then that one per month and then after that month, Sumaya say, yeah, we have this much and then after that we can build this. Mama, no. No. I just tell God supply. He can get one guy. That's what is happening. By the way, in Fanero, the biggest givers are few. But they are led by God. And God gives them the ability. May I just say, direct a man. Did you get what I just said? We just said direct one man. We don't need to waste time on everybody. Not everybody builds ministry. But all of them feed from it. That's the truth. Not everybody. but Pastors, we can't say that everyone give 10,000. 10, then if we give and you're 10,000 people, and each of us, that's this much. You can't. Why? Because there's a man you're already limiting. There's a man who... Who feels offended because God has given him too much to give 10,000? And, and that's what we see. We see people who come and they say, Apostle God has told me to do this. And they pay the whole sum of it. The whole sum of it. The whole sum of it. Just like that. Why? Because. We don't have a consciousness to lack. That's why I don't fundraise in service. Because we are not conscious. Even if you look for it, it's not there. That Fanero one time will wake up and we lack money. <laughs> With a multi billionaires, trillionaires in dollars we got here. <laughs> Cannot happen. Will never happen. Somebody shout hallelujah. And they are ready readily. I had to develop a consciousness that our people are generous and indeed they became generous. Because that's the mentality we have toward you. That's the consciousness we have toward you. Are you following what I'm saying? But we know the responsibility. That's why we account. Call our partners. We show you how, how your money has been used. You understand? You, we show you how we've spent your money. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor you are not created to be conscious of lack. I'll give you an example and finish. In Exodus chapter 1 verse 7, the Bible speaks of the children of Israel. They were fruitful in verse 7 and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. And the Bible says, and the land was filled with them. 
Now there arose upon a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, and he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of the Israelites, Israel, sorry, are more and more mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. They said, let's plan for these fellows, otherwise they are going to multiply them more. And the Bible says, eh? Okay. Come now, let us deal wisely, lest they multiply. And it came to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also our enemies and fight against us and so get up out of the get us out of the land. Now, therefore, they did set over the taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. They they put burdens on them and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, pithoms and Ramses. But the more the Bible says they were afflicted, the more listen. And I want you to see the, the mindset of God. The more the Bible says they were afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew. And the Bible says, and the Egyptians were grieved because of the children of Israel. Let me explain this. See, some of you, you read these, these scriptures on top. Let's go a bit slowly. He didn't say that the more they are, were afflicted, they continued growing. Remember, the Bible says they were already growing. The Bible says they were already what? Growing and multiplying. Are you hearing me? Now, you might think the scripture says that when they were afflicted, okay, God ignored the affliction, created a situation where they continued growing while they were being afflicted. No, he says, the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied. Meaning, if they were multiplying at 60%, right, or 60-fold, and then you afflict them, they start multiplying on 120-fold. Who has understood what he has said? That means that when situations come that are there to shake your multiplication, they are only there to multiply your multiplication. Slap somebody if you've understood it. I say it's, it meant a high five. Somebody really slapped the high five. Do you understand what I just said? Say the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. That means to the degree Satan afflicts is to the degree God multiplies the, much, the growth. It's to the degree the Lord multiplies the increase. It's to the degree the Lord multiplies the abundance. He multiplies where affliction is. That means me, I don't believe in double, double, double. Me, I don't think everything is double, double. Because I don't want to receive double, double. I don't receive the portion of double, double. No. God will give you double for your trouble. And I turn away and say, God, that's not me. May I receive more than double. I multiply. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. You see that even in the time when they were still enslaved under Egypt, God didn't have the mentality of them reducing. In fact, the scriptures tell us, by the time the slaves left Egypt, they were very rich. By the time the Israelites left Egypt, they had gold, they had silver, they had cattle, they had everything, yet they were still slaves. Slaves left, they crossed the Red Sea with gold, with silver, they left with Animals, they were rich, yet they were slaves. Yet they were rich. Meaning, this, even when you're a slave, even if you work for so and so, even if you serve so and so, even if you work in a small little business, that does not mean that you'll be poor. Stop staking the godly blessing on your life, on your salary, or your wage. By the time, I won't say it because some of you will misunderstand me. But me, when I was in the bank, I said, God, I have to be richer than all these guys above me. And it was so by the time I left the bank. Because it was a consciousness. I didn't earn based on their pay. No, I earned based on his riches in glory. In Christ. <laughs> you shall by a consciousness. And it was so. I said, realize, I said, earning more and more than all my guys above. That means I was not in the bank to make money. I was in the bank 
to fulfill divine purpose. And when it was done, I went to do other things. That's the mentality. You're not working in that business to build a house and then have a nice car. No. Nobody can pay you on the light of the blessing of God. On the weight of the abundance God has put on your spirit as his blessing. We all work wherever we work to fulfill assignment. But when it comes to the blessing of God, that one doesn't respect who you work for, what your job description is, and what your wage or pay is. That's why I tell young people, even if they give you 50K, find purpose and work. Don't wait, say, that come on, I don't even have transport. Who, who told you transport is supposed to come from your job? And then you say you trust God? Hey, I rebuke you. Now there is silence. Now the older people are the ones saying amen. These ones who are working. Bugamba, apostle, Bugambi. Bugambo, Bufubuka. Praise God, somebody. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 19. Give me the message version and I'll finish with that. He was talking about the children of Israel. 100, uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 19. We'll read the message version. He says, you, in your amazing compassion, the Bible says, now we are talking about them in the wilderness. We've, we've left the place where they were in Egypt, right? And now, even while they were still slaves in Egypt, and their families were slaves for, enslaved for 430 years, they were still not lacking. They were still multiplying, right? Now, they come into the wilderness. And the Bible says, you, in your amazing compassion, did what? Didn't walk off and leave them in the desert. The pillar of the cloud did not leave them. Daily it continued to show them their route. The pillar of fire did the same by night and showed them the right way to go. You gave them your good spirit to teach them to live wisely. You never stinted with your manner. You gave them plenty of water to drink. Praise God. You supported them for 40 years in the desert. And they had every... Eh, woo, they were going to the promised land. But in the process of going to the promised land, he still gave them everything. <laughs> promised land is not when you have everything. No. <laughs> the Bible says even before they were in the promised land, even, even in your wilderness, who has understood what I just said? Even though you, you, you have not yet reached where God has ordained you to, to reach, but may I speak upon your life and say that you will not lack everything or anything, sorry, that you need. That's the mentality. He means to say, maybe the end of you is to be the richest man in the world. But in the process, he still makes sure he provides enough while he's preparing you. Hallelujah. Praise God, somebody. So some people think that some of us have arrived. No, we are still on the journey. It's just the beginning of great things coming. Don't, don't be deceived by the car she's driving. Don't be deceived by the house she's living in. No, God is going to do way more, way more. But even in the process, God does not intend that a man should need. That's why I said, when you awaken to the consciousness, the principles happen through you. You just learn to do. You just learn to give. What is the first fruit? How do I do it? Because it's a consciousness. It's in your spirit. Why? You know that you're rich. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says their clothes didn't wear out and their feet never what? Blistered. Tell your neighbor that's provision. He says you gave them kingdoms and peoples, establishing generous boundaries. They took over the country of Sihon, the king of Hezbon, and the country of Og, the king of Bashan. You multiplied children for them, rivaling the stars in the night and skies. You brought them into the land that you promised their ancestors that they would get on their own. Well, they entered all right. They took it even in the wilderness, the Bible says, and settled in. The Canaanites who lived there, you brought to their knees before them. You turned over their land, their kings, their peoples to do as they pleased. They took strong cities and fertile fields. They took over well-furnished houses, cisterns, vineyards, olive groves, lush, extensive orchards. And they ate, grew fat on the fat of the land. They reveled in the bountiful goodness of God. You will never lack. God has not made you to lack. He has not created you to lack. 
He has not ordained you to lack. It's not in his mind for you to want any good thing. So stop putting money as a very important aspect. When you understand that it's not in the consciousness of God to lack, money stops to become a big deal. You don't even boast over it. Because it's, it's, it's not in God's mind for you to lack. Even when you're on your way, he makes sure that everything is provided. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That we cannot get rid of poverty when we still carry the consciousness of lack. Whoever has had me today, from today, it does not matter whether you have money on your account or you don't have money. Don't be intimidated by the state of your account. Don't be intimidated by the emptiness of your pocket. Don't be intimidated by what you have and what you don't have. Don't be intimidated because you're seated on a board and somebody just passed by with a BMW. Don't be intimidated. All of those things are only a matter of time. Carry the consciousness that I will not lack any good thing. Do the principles of God like a rich man. Give like a rich woman. Don't wait to have money. No. Some of you should understand. Some of us started educating children when, when our parents started to give us pocket money. You don't, know, you don't want to know how little it was. But it was through that that I started educating kids. Why? Because in my university, in Mukono, where I went, there were kids who used to study for 50,000 shillings a term during those years. And so I would save my pocket money and say, let me take this kid to school. And I'll open the scripture and say, God, enough grace is abounded to me to have all sufficiency in all that I need and be available for every good work. I mean every. When, that's why I tell people, when you hear they're doing something, it doesn't matter how small. It doesn't matter how small. Just because you believe that you are God's conduit. Wealth comes with responsibility. You know why I'm telling you? Because you see, God told me a few years ago that you're going to pastor the richest people the world has ever seen. And I'm not sorry for that also. Now we are not, that is beyond faith. That's knowledge because he spoke. You understand? But we must have responsibility for it. There's somebody here. You have struggled for years and years and years. You probably don't even have food to eat tonight. You probably don't know where you're going to go after service because the landlord is looking for you. They assembled on this ground, you almost committed suicide because you were tired of poverty. There's a woman on this ground, you're sleeping in a house you're not supposed to sleep in, but because the man has money. You're giving your body to a man you know you're not supposed to give your body to. But you're telling me, Apostle, if I leave, where will I go? Where will I have food? That man became your God. It is because you have a certain consciousness. Do you know how many women are selling their bodies on the streets? And exchanging their lives for a living because they are conscious that they're poor. Do you know how many compromises people are doing at their workplaces? And how many people, businessmen are cheating even their taxes because of the consciousness of lack. Do you know how many people in their greed are doing things to destroy others because they know that by destroying one person, they'll be elevated to have more. Do you know how many things are, are moved because of many dark things that people do in darkness because of money? Do you know how many people have sacrificed their own children because of the consciousness of money, of luck. Do you know people have sacrificed their own wives? And they're willing to let and live a life to die because they don't want to be poor. They are conscious that they're poor. That should not be so for a believer. Get to your feet. Refuse to have a consciousness toward luck. Refuse to have a consciousness toward luck. Whether you have yet or you don't have physically. Refuse to walk like a, a beggar in this world. Refuse 
have a self pride to say God even if I don't have it I will not beg it I will not stoop low to kill the glory of blessed upon my life and provoke the grace of the blessing on my life because I'm conscious to lack refuse to be conscious to lack it's a consciousness it's not a state for a new creature it's not a state for the fallen man it is but for a new creature lack is not a state it's a consciousness come out of it come out of it come out of it come on speak to God speak to God speak to God God we are tired of poverty even in Uganda even in Africa there are people who have lost their loved ones because they could not even afford a tablet that should be far from us in the name of Jesus come on speak to God there is a man here you've been struggling and struggling and struggling but your hand has failed on everything you've invested into it has died there are people watching me right now you're in foreign land you left your nations to go and work but right now as I'm speaking you're in that living room and you don't even have more than $300 in your pocket yet you left your nation to foreign land to work even the money you paid for the tickets is more than the money you've ever handled in that nation ever since you went there and some of them have spent 10 years there 20 years there 15 years there 30 years there they have children but every other day it becomes harder and harder that's a consciousness change your mind change your consciousness put up your hands i want to bless you father in the name of jesus as your word has been spoken tonight, I decree that every man and woman at the sound of my voice, that the consciousness of lack dies today. It will never be hard. It will never be seen. It will never be entertained in their souls ever, in their minds ever, in their spirits ever. It will never be there. They'll walk head high because they know what you have done. The Bible says you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Bible says you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The Bible says that whether Apple or so Paul, whether things present or things to come, he says all are yours and your Christ's. He is the God who ceaselessly gives us all things to enjoy. And may that be a reality in every home. May parents pay fees for their children, Lord. May that person find the job to serve you, God. May that woman find something to do. May people have provision enough, God, to build a kingdom too. And most importantly, actually, may they have enough for their own families. May we not hear that women had, have failed, have died on the road because they cannot raise enough money to get to a hospital to give birth. And a Christian most of all. May it not be had that a Christian's child died because they could not afford a basic thing to provide. That should not be had. May we not hear that our young men and women will give in their selves, their bodies and their reputation and who they are before God for the compromise of a little morsel of meat. May they not sell their birthright. Even as preachers, God, we pray for ourselves. Help us pastors not to, to mal manipulate people in the name of the gospel because we also carry a consciousness to lack help us to father we thank you because great things are happening and doors are opening for your people and with that God we know that you will prove our hearts and reveal our hearts to the responsibility of that blessing and in the process you will humble us too but not only should it be a lack of money God he said anything beneficial. Get people married, God. Give the barren children in the name of Jesus. Bring peace. Give happiness to somebody in the name of Jesus. I rebuke poverty, the spirit of somebody's life in the name of Jesus. 
And I decree great things await us. And our future is bright. In Jesus' name. And all saints said. Now if you're here. And you've never given your life to Christ. And you say, you know what? Apostle Grace, I feel like I want to receive Jesus today. There are people on this ground God is convicting to be born again. You, some of you even came, you felt it that you are going to receive Jesus tonight as your Lord and Savior. Some of you are convicted during the sermon. You see, if you're of the fallen nature, the things we are speaking of are not of you or for you. That is why we want to give you an open invitation to come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The best decision you are going to make and you'll ever make in this life. So if you're there and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please walk here. Walk here. Walk here. Walk here. Walk here. Come. Ask your neighbor for me. If they're not born again, tell them, go and receive Jesus. Come. Come. God bless you as you're coming. Come. In all I do, I shall prosper. Everything I touch shall be blessed. King shall come to my right. Cause I am favored and brave And all I do I shall prosper Everything I touch shall be blessed Anybody else? Come quickly. This is the best miracle that could ever happen to you. Put up your hands. Those of you who are receiving Jesus. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I have heard your word. And tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died for me. And you were raised for my glory. Tonight, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you who have met... The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com you can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still feel free to join us every thursday for our weekly fellowships at uma multipurpose hall from 5 p.m to 8 p.m you can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash fenero fenero make manifest